G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Today's discussion we're going to have with Strawn Taylor from Helia. Uh, what we think we're going to talk about lenders, mortgage insurance, we're going to talk a lot more about that. And we're going to talk about home ownership, we're going to talk about building a property portfolio as well, given that a large uh, portion of our audience are property investors. I want to go back a step and talk about insurance just for one second. I'll give you a, um, a quick personal anecdote that just happened recently. Over the weekend, our daughter put her hand through our, one of our glass windows and uh, it didn't end up well. A uh, big cut through her arm. Um, and yeah, in this country, you don't think twice. You call triple zero and five minutes later, there's an ambulance that comes onto your doorstep, whisks our daughter away to hospital. Um, next minute, there's you know x-rays being done. There's nurses, there's doctors, there's surgeons that turn up as well. And that whole time, no one is asking how we're going to pay for this. Or when we walked out of surgery and our daughter's discharged, Sienna, no one's handing me a bill at the end of that. That is what insurance does. It also speaks volumes to this country as well. And when I talk to clients about when they say it's expensive to buy property in this country, I say the first thing is, but we have such a high standard of living. And when you need our country, it absolutely delivers in spades. I'm talking our infrastructure. Uh, I'll give you one example. We we just took a family holiday to Malaysia recently and to drive around, I'm talking less than 20 Ks, it took probably an hour and a half. And I thought city traffic was bad. You do Bangkok, you do KL, you do some parts of Asia and you're like, uh, even Bali and you're like, this, we've got it so good here. Yes, we've got a high cost of living, but we have a very, very high standard of living. And there's a price that comes to pay for that, which means trying to get into the property market. So that's why I want to circle back and just say that is generally the hardest part is the deposit to get into the property market. Lenders Mortgage Insurance provides an absolute stepping stone to get in there. Strong, right. welcome on. How you doing, buddy? Thank you very much, Aaron. Great to be here. Thank you, mate. That kind of sets the scene for what I want to talk mm. about today, which is there's so much that we're going to get through when it comes to lenders mortgage insurance. I think one of the big things is it's how, how it's misunderstood, yep. how it's missold, mm-hmm. how it's misrepresented as well. So I, I feel like we're going to set the record straight a little bit today <laughs> as well. Good. good. Yeah, but yeah. first of all, mate, yeah. how you doing? You've been you've been um, you know, been on before, and I have. great to have you back been, on. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, I've uh, no, been good. A uh, lot going on, both in the industry, yep. um, and at home. Um, uh, just just by way of background, sort of uh, young family, two kids. My eldest has just got her L's. Congratulations! And you'll see, there's a lot more grey up <laughs> here. Okay, from driving around Sydney streets with yeah. an L plater. Anyway, that's lots of fun. Um, and we continue to um, to get them more okay, interested yeah. in, in sport nice. which they're enjoying. So, yeah, yeah lots, lots of fun um, and a lot of work going on um, in, in our industry, in, in my space at, uh, at Helia, formerly Gemworth LMI, trying to work on educating people about how to get into, uh, into homes. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. I mean, I, I look at your tenure, I think, what, we're close to 30 years you know, in the industry, mm-hmm. so... Um, well seasoned, well experienced, for example, bring uh, you know all that knowledge to Helia, and really, I guess your role you see is part advocacy but part engagement. Right. And we talk a lot about our industry, so we're going to mention a few kind of a bit of a jargon, mm-hmm. an aggregator, for example. Yes. Most most consumers, most borrowers would never have heard of what an aggregator oh. is. So I'll give you I'll give you some context. Uh, as a mortgage broker, there's like eighteen, nineteen thousand brokers across Australia. Uh, Commonwealth Bank can't deal directly with 19,000 brokers. So they have a intermediary or, or middle person, you, you know, well-known uh, aggregators, are, you know, at Aussie Mortgage Choice, for example, uh, MoneyQuest, you know, kind of franchise. Then you have some brands like Connective, AFG, uh, who else have you got in the mix? I mean, you've got plenty in the mix there Loan as well. Market Loan Market, group. yes, yep. uh, is, is a big one as well. Yep. And they, they will hold the agreement with a mortgage broker and then deal directly and have all these agreements in place with, with banks as yep. well. So your role is very much to come in at the aggregator level and it's B2B at this point going, how do we then help engage but yeah. also educate as well, yeah? yeah? Uh, we're, we're across the entire industry, right? Yeah. So we talk to the lenders, we talk to aggregators, we talk to individual brokers, we talk to borrowers. Yeah. Um, and it's about making sure that people are well informed on the options they have at their disposal to get them into a property. Um, Helia have been around since 1965. Um, yeah, and we, we were set up to actually help first home buyers get into the market. Um, and you were talking about cost of living pressures and how hard it is to get into the property market. It was still hard nearly 60 years ago, which is why we were set up because lenders wouldn't lend above 80% of the value of the property. Uh, now they do, yeah. right, which, which is a great thing. So um, we're very passionate about um, helping people get into into the property, 
um, and 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 build wealth through property as well. Yeah. So uh, we're we're across the industry, and so engagement like this is always uh, welcome. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So if you're if you're relatively new to this space, lenders mortgage insurance is a product that comes into play when the borrower doesn't have a twenty percent deposit. Yep. So when you go over eighty percent loan to value ratio, the bank then wants the insurance policy to kick in. Correct. And then cover and it covers the bank, not the borrower, which. That's cool. The bank's taking on some risk. They're lending you the money. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they want to kind of package it up, put a pretty bow on it saying, yes, we've ticked our boxes and we're good to go, but we need to insure this loan. Mm. Do you see, this is more an industry chat, do you see that kind of going, look, the property market's done so well, why can't we move that to say 85% no Mm. mortgage insurance? So there's a couple of banks that will do it, but the rates are slightly higher. Yep. Is there is there been any discussion around kind of lifting that ceiling to say eighty five percent based on the, the? There's a lot of there's a lot of um, quite um, advanced sort of mathematics um, around probability and around performance of home loans over a very long time mm. that can demonstrate at eighty percent. Once you go over that, the risk of those loans defaulting kicks up. Okay. Right, and so. Um, you talked about Australia having great infrastructure and you know, high cost of living, high quality of living. We've also got a very robust banking industry um, or finance industry and that is very much on the back of a lot of the regulation that we have in this space. Um, the GF, the you know, global financial crisis, GFC, which which happened in sort of 2007-08, uh, mm. um, for those that remember, globally was a massive, massive shock to the industry but in Australia, we largely went through unscathed. Yeah. That was because of the strength of our um, of our industry, which is on the back of a lot of regulation. And so, you know, could we see that having to be insured at uh, eighty and above, or above eighty go away? Look, possibly. Never say no, but it's unlikely um, because of the statistics that go behind what that is. Yeah. Now, some uh, some lenders will not require insurance for certain people. Um, above 80 and again that's based on risk performance over time but that bank is then taking on the risk okay right so um yeah we look we don't see that changing um there's not been any um conversations from apra the regulatory body about that Mm -hmm. um but lenders have got far more sophisticated and i'd have to say better at writing and understanding risk yeah Right, and so we're seeing low low historical claims at the moment, and that's partly to do with the way lenders write um, credit issue issue loans. It's also got to do with the strength of the economy, okay, uh, going on. Um, but yeah, you know, there still are people that get into trouble, and that's why we're here. As you said, you know, with your daughter, um, you can have health insurance for years and years and years and barely ever use it, and suddenly something like that happens, Perfect. which is why that's very important to have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Insurance has always been like grudge mm. purchase. It's mm. a bit of a grudge product, but you don't you you don't realize the value of it till you truly need it. You need it. Yeah, That's well said. Right. Well said. Perfect. So, uh, I mean, one of the big things that we had a chat about is this is a product. You know, distribution wise, you can go to a bank or you go to a, a broker to get your loan. Brokers are writing a large amount of loans mm-hmm. now, which you know, increases. Um, it increases the pressure on brokers to one have good product knowledge, but also when consumers are coming, they're coming with a fair amount of education as well. They've done their own research, so that bar gets lifted as well. I was shocked. Now we're going to bring up the results. So, uh, so Healy have commissioned what they call a broker sentiment report, mm-hmm. which is then going to like unpack, I guess, the way that mortgage insurance is interpreted and then mm-hmm. effectively sold mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, and I'm. I'm going to say I'm I'm mortified as a mortgage broker. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I had a client come to us probably a fortnight ago and, you know, the broker was his broker, his parents' broker, been around for quite some time. I thought, awesome. You know, I said, look, if you've got a relationship, keep it in place. He says, no, I'm not sure because he keeps insisting that I have to have a 20% deposit. I said, at that point, run, run Mm -hmm. for the hills. Uh, I said that broker probably shouldn't be operating and I'm, I'm not going to hold back. Like normally I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty chill. But at this point, this has got me, this has got me a real, like uh, it's a bee in my bonnet. Mm. Uh, if a broker is ever suggesting that you need a 20% deposit, run for the hills and just know that they probably lack product knowledge. And I don't say it's slightly because they're my peers uh, and I'm not big noting ourselves. There's plenty of other good brokers and we'll talk about this in a second. 
But I just don't understand it. Mm. I cannot for the life understand me why a broker would suggest that you have to have a 20% yeah, deposit. No, it was a surprise to us, which is um, w- when we've been talking to, to brokers and, and lenders, we found that was a quite disparity between yeah. people's understanding, which is why we did this research. Um, and I suppose the, the good thing is um, all the brokers we researched had, under, had heard of LMI. Yeah, okay. so okay. awareness good. is there, Tech, 100% awareness. Is there. awareness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then when you asked them what it was, technically they could they could describe it because it's, it's an insurance product that insures lenders. Okay, great. That's fantastic. And, and that's where it stopped for a lot of brokers. Um, and so what we found, though, is brokers weren't really understanding what it actually did, mm. right, the, the, the broader implications, um, being that if, if I'm insured as a lender, then I have more confidence to lend, right, and so I'm willing to lend more and and essentially take on risk that's been covered by us yeah. over time. Um, and so as we delve deeper, we found some interesting things. There was a cohort of brokers that were very successful, mm. had been in the industry a while, but understood all the options available to their borrowers, including LMI. Yeah. Therefore, they could put a suite of options to them and say, let's work through what you've got. But they wouldn't start the conversation at a 20% deposit. They'd start the conversation at a 4 or 5% yeah. deposit, right? makes a big difference in terms of time and also what you can do. Yeah. You all said, I mean, this is, we're talking about opportunity cost and we'll come to yeah. opportunity cost and waiting in a second because yep. you've got some really good stats around that as well. But if we look here... 27% of mortgage brokers see LMI as an unnecessary expense. Mm-hmm. What what options does someone have when the property market is doing some incredible numbers year on year and you're trying to change you're trying to chase a 20% deposit versus getting at say 2% you know mortgage insurance fee. Mm-hmm. You stop renting, mm-hmm. maybe you know you you better put down roots. Over that time you've been able to do some maybe a little bit of work on the property. It's increased yep. in value as well. Yep for paying a small fee to get in. Now, I always say to clients, you buy what you can when you can. Absolutely. At the time that's right yeah. and the right property more than anything. Like you choose the right asset to get into the yeah. market. But if you keep waiting and, you know, there's been some, I guess, some really strong personalities, i.e. the barefoot investor that says you need to set deposit. Yep. In my book, I, I said I called that out. I, I just don't, I can't understand why that's a thing. Maybe on, in yesteryear where people could actively say, but when we talk about, House prices are thirteen times you know, average, average income. income. That's right. You are chasing your tail. You are, and, and uh, there's some research in the market, not ours, that has looked at um, how long it takes you to save twenty percent. Yeah. Um, and and to your point, I agree. I think this fixation on twenty percent um, is actually hurting a lot of people, Absolutely. right? But if you do want to save twenty percent for the average house in Sydney, you're looking at ten to eighteen years. Right, and so if we start today, 2024, right, end of July 24, and think forward 18 years, um, you just think of your kids, right? Oh, yeah. They'll be through university, they'll might even have a family, all that sort of stuff. Where are house prices going to be in 18 years, right? So um, savings will erode over correct, time. Exactly, yeah. and can you can you save enough to keep up with the with price increases? Now, and let's be um, clear too: property prices do not always go up, mm. right? Our market operates in an economic cycle and they do go up and down. But over the long term, prices go up. And that is that is irrefutable. You have a look at all the trend data, CoreLogic has it, and on average they're going up between 6 and 8% per annum compound. Compounding, right? correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's where that magic really starts to happen. Mm. So, mm. yeah, if you're listening and uh, if you're a mortgage broker or you're a borrower and you – uh, you are staunch in your belief that you need a twenty percent deposit. I'd love to have a chat. Yeah. Reach out. I'd love to get your view on it. Uh, convince me that I'm wrong, for example. Uh, but every client that I've helped that has paid, generally, what we find a sweet spot in mortgage insurance to get into the market. Twelve months later, eighteen months later, they're like, right, let's go again. Especially investor clients. Especially when we go to get their equity out, we're splitting the equity across two investments. Now they've got double the chance of increasing in value as well. They're in the market probably in two different parts of Australia as well that are growing at different rates. Two lots of rental income that are coming in and we're going, how good? And they're saying, how good is this? And they've got the equity that could usually fund a 20% deposit for one property. We're splitting that across two. And that's what we're talking about scalability in, in, in a portfolio and growing a, a portfolio that can build you one, passive income, but two, build intergenerational wealth through property, which uh, that's effective why this podcast is set up is to help you 
build intergenerational wealth through property. So this gives us a really good platform to kind of work off as well. I mean, we talk about 64% for mortgage insurance is great for investors. So that's over half investors could be clipping the ticket as well. And I mean, I bought, we had the equity to do it, but I bought one of our recent properties at a 90% including LMI, LMI yep. right? And I was like, right, now I can draw back up to 90% when I get this revalued and it's yep. already gone up. And I'm yep. like, mate, we can we can, we can can rock and roll again. And, yep. it's, it's and, and the cost of LMI for investment, <clears throat> right? It's yeah. a cost of acquiring the property. Yep. It is a tax deductible cost. Correct. Right. And so whatever your uh, views are on negative gearing, good, bad or indifferent, it is actually currently in the market. It's available to you. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's, a, it's letting the tax man help you. Right, get into property, and so it's there to be utilised. Yeah, perfect. Let's go through these examples because mm. I love what uh, I love what your team's put out with. Uh, I guess some real comparisons side by side. So we talk about twenty twenty three to twenty twenty four, mm. which has been a pretty good year in growth. I mean, we're talking about off the back of thirteen rate rises. Yeah, I know. Um, so this is all the the backdrop to, and then people thinking, you know, fixed rate cliff, property price is going to fall. I'm going to wait for my time to mm. get into the market. Let's see what waiting has done if you're trying to get into the market. So if you're if you're listening to this audio, you may want to jump in and check out the video on YouTube, for example. It's going to have the slides. Uh, let's have a look. So pr- median house prices sits at $767,000 yep. in 2023. Yep. Come forward to 2024, that house price is now $848,000. Mm-hmm. So the difference is eighty one k. Yep. To get in... In 2023, the mortgage insurance you paid is just shy of thirteen thousand yep. dollars, which is a net gain if you include it of sixty eight thousand dollars if you take out the mortgage insurance. Mm. So mm. you made sixty eight k already. Already, yep. If you've been renting, you're not renting anymore, so that gets added into the pool as Correct. well. Yep. The other thing that I had a look at, particularly if you're a first home buyer, I'll come. Mm. I'll come back to you in a second, yeah, just I, to give this some context. Mm. So you paid thirteen grand in mortgage insurance, but if you're a first home buyer and you're buying that house for seven sixty seven, and in New South Wales, look, we might be lucky to buy something, but you've paid no stamp duty, but you come forward to twenty twenty four eight forty eight and you've paid ten grand in stamp duty. So not only have had you've had to save sixteen thousand dollars extra to hit a twenty percent deposit, but you've also had to pay ten grand extra in stamp duty, which puts that at twenty six k. You divide that by fifty two, for example, five hundred bucks a week thereabouts. People aren't saving that five hundred dollars a week extra to keep up with the price growth and the stamp duty as yep. well. Yep. yep. So there's there's a number of things at play here. Um, to, to your earlier point, it's if if you can get into the property uh, as as soon as you possibly can, then go for it. Yeah. Um, trying to time the market, and this is in any investment, is means you've got an absolute um, you know view into the future, right? Mm. And no one does. Um, I often get asked, when's the best time to buy a property? <laughs> I say it's always the best time to buy a property mm. regardless, right, because it gets you in. Property does go up and down, but in the long term it's going up. So that's the first thing. Second thing, um, if you uh, use mortgage insurance, you can get in with a 5% deposit, mm. right, plus costs, um, versus 20%, right? So you only have to put 25% worth of effort, right, to get going as opposed to 100% to get to that 20% deposit. Mm. On those numbers, um, that uh, – that uh, position where you're you're ahead after a year, right, by sixty eight thousand dollars, you're actually ahead in many in many ways. That's just after a year, you've actually saved yourself two point two years, ten weeks in mm. terms of saving. So if you if if you in twenty twenty three said actually I'm not going to buy now, I want to save that twenty percent deposit, and you could put a thousand dollars a week away, right, over that year, that's about fifty two thousand extra dollars, mm. right. The property's actually gone away from you. You're still not there, right? And yeah. so it's got you in. In 2.2 years, so you've got it, you've saved yourself 2.2 years, right? In 2.2 years, where's that property going to be, right? So you've, I think you've got to think about what the product can do for you, right, And um, rather than the expense or cost, yes. right? So that, that, that's the key thing we say. The other thing we say is, look, LMI is not the only option. We're quite open about right, that, okay? Okay. Um, You've got government grants, okay, and we're aware, well aware of that. Um, you've got, you know, if your parents can um, go as a guarantor, that's available too. That has its own issues, which yeah. we've, we've found as well. And there's LMI. So so make sure you're looking broadly at your options, yeah. but don't discount LMI because it's a very powerful product. Perfect. Mm. So let's go through these three options. Mm. Option one, you said government grants. Mm-hmm. Now, to get a government grant, you've got to tick a few boxes. You do. Yeah. One is income. Yep. 
So to buy a property at say 800K, you divide that by four-ish, mm -hmm. you're talking about combined income's around 200K, mm -hmm. yeah? Thereabouts. Now, generally some of these uh, government grants are capping out at say combined income's 100, 150, for yep. example, maybe yep. 200. Yep. Uh, I, got, I got asked Damien because he's the man around this one. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be able to buy in New South Wales in a window that they give you a space in, in the scheme as well. Yes. So if you don't find it, you fall out of the scheme, you've got to reapply as well. Yep. Uh, lenders, some specific lenders offer it, which means you have to meet their policies. Correct. If you have something slightly unusual mm -hmm. you, and you're not eligible at that lender, you don't get the, a, a ticket in the scheme. Mm -hmm. They're just, I mean, they're just some of the ex rule. And when we, when we kind of pull, uh, uh, pull up in the hood and say, this is what an option is available to you, you've whittled yourself down to one, a couple of lender options you do. as opposed to yeah. opening yourself up to 30 well, different it's banks. It's forcing you to play in a box, hmm. right? Where LMI does not. Yeah. Okay. Um, now that might work for you, which is great. Absolutely, right? so it's absolutely. awesome. And, yeah. and and brokers get that and they understand it. Unfortunately, some only look at that. That's it. Right. So mm. what we want is put all options on the table. Yeah. And work with your clients. What's best for me? Yeah. Right? That, that's the key thing. Great. Mm. Thank you. The next option you said is the bank of mum and dad. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the bank of mum and dad can come into play in a few different ways. One is you said equi like equity in the way yep. of a, a guarantor loan. Yep. What you've got to remember is when we do a guarantor and you actually have to be able to service the debt. Most people think, oh, I'm going to get extra cash on top of that, therefore I can buy for more. It's like, no, no, you have to be able to borrow in your capacity the guarantor components. That's, that's, that's commonly misunderstood. It's also, it's family and money. And, I, and look, generally I say it goes pretty well from a loan perspective, getting it set up in the structure, right? What people don't see and they only will experience it afterwards is that there's a slight shift in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's family and money, so it has its own dynamic. Mm -hmm. Some families are really, really good and cool with it. Others, you know, when you when you buy the new car or you take a holiday to Europe and they're looking going, hang on, don't you owe us some money? Mm -hmm. Why are you scooting off to Europe mm -hmm. or a family holiday buying a new car, for example? You're trying to get on with your life, but now they're looking and going, you owe us this money as well and it can just cause a little bit of a shift or if there's siblings, then if you do it for one child, you got to do it for, Correct. for the others or if there's stepchildren, uh, yep. uh, blended families, yep. that has a different dynamic as well. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying from my experience, this is what typically happens. Yeah, yeah. look, it's it's a, certainly it's an option yep. um, but think deeply about it. Uh, and also for families that have like siblings, two, three, four kids, um, it does put a lot. Of, it can put a lot of stress on on families. Um, we actually have a product where if you pay the LMI up front, um, and generally a fa family will assist in that, you get an additional discount, right? Okay. So whatever the price is with whatever lender, uh, and they do vary, we'll add an additional fifteen percent discount to that product. So that can help as well, and that helps if, uh, especially for families that want to help multiple kids get in, yeah. um, either, you know, putting up a 20% deposit for multiple kids gets very expensive yeah. or putting up a family house for multiple kids gets complex right, yes. and, and expensive. So that's an option too. To, and, and think of that, ask your broker about that um, because if it's with our product, the Helia product, and you want to pay that up front, we give you an extra discount. Awesome. Yeah, which is good. And the other part is we've spoken, we had a quick chat, is around monthly premiums. Mm -hmm. And, again, that's, yeah, I'd say awareness is probably lower in that sense going uh, a few lenders do offer it. Take someone through how does a monthly LMI yep. premium work as opposed to the, the upfront? Sure. So um, historically and traditionally LMI has been paid up front, generally put onto the loan, which we call capitalised, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, depending on the, the size of the loan, will probably kick the payments up by 5 10 15 20 bucks 20 um, a week, right? Mm -hmm. it's, so it's there. Um, monthly is a product out of the USA. They, they mainly use monthly. Um, and where instead of paying up front, you just pay on a monthly basis. So a few hundred dollars um, gets added onto what you say so your loan. You pay, let's say it's two, three thousand dollars for your loan, and you know two hundred and fifty to five hundred dollars for the LMI. The beauty of monthly though is one, it uh, reduces your upfront costs. Absolutely. Okay. It does come become part of servicing, so you've got to know, know that. But once the loan drops below eighty percent. And lenders will have a buffer. So generally it's 78% because property values vary. But once it drops below a particular percentage, it drops away. Mm. Right? So if you, uh, if you have a reasonable, um, reasonably strong cash flow um, and uh, there's reasonable house price appreciation in the market, it's a very viable product yeah. uh, to consider. 
The problem is only a few lenders currently offer it. Yes. Now, we're working with a whole lot to get it into market, but it's not widely offered, which is yeah. probably the, the biggest issue. Yeah, again, a handful of lenders offer it. It's just good to know that it exists. Mm. And if you qualify with that, you know, those particular couple of banks, mm. it can just help from that upfront. If you're not adding that, you know, uh, capitalizing to loan, like you're saying, yeah. it's like we can just keep going for a, call it a few six months, uh, you know, six months. Mm. We're in a high growth area, get it revalued, away we go. And, you know, it's been a yeah. small cost of doing business. But again, I, and, and this is maybe where it goes back up to our conversation around brokers. Brokers are sell, think they're selling a loan. And this is the challenge. Mm -hmm. You're not buying a loan, you're buying a home, you're buying a property. So the loan can be chopped and changed at any point. So when I think about buying a product, if I can't swap it, change it, then effectively I've had to buy it, which is a property. Versus a loan can be chopped and changed at any point. So you're not actually buying it, you're effectively renting the loan or leasing the loan for the time that you need it. And you can switch and change banks as you as you okay. need to. Yeah. So Again, just and I'll have this conversation with clients and they just can't get their head around it because they've been so conditioned to buy the lowest interest rate, for example. It's got to have an offset account. I'm like, mate, that, that's par for course. It's going to happen with every every bank that we work with. But you're not buying the loan. So they, they think that's the product you're buying. You're buying the property. Yeah. We're seeing the property increase in value. Think outcome. Think outcome. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, good. Great. So if we go to the next slide across. So what we've got here is yeah, a breakdown across the country, mm. which shows us again, the performance. I mean, I'm seeing all pluses in price growth, probably except for Darwin, which had Darwin and negative one. Yeah, Darwin does. And that, that's, it, it's good to see that Yeah, because you understand the property doesn't always go up. And this is just a year's view. Right. One, so, yeah, um, but look, if you look at that across the board, um, it's, it's a pretty impressive um, price increase, which just shows you about you want to get in as soon as you possibly can, Correct. right? Because once you do, as you said, you stop renting. Um, you actually are on the, uh, I suppose, property ladder, which you might have heard before, but you're earning equity in the property. Spot on. Um, and then as you as that builds, it gives you um, it gives you capability and purchasing power to do other stuff and start building wealth. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So if you look around the country, if you sat back and waited, for example, it's it's not serving you to wait. No. Uh, and again, we, if we keep beating this drum, it's until we can get this message across and more people that are listening go, yep, I see LMI is just a simple way, a simple vehicle or tool to get into the market, maybe splitting deposits, maybe it's getting in uh, and, and maybe stretching yourself a little bit more as well. But you'll thank us later in a couple of years' time when we go to revalue a property, not even a couple of years, you go to revalue that property in one year's time mm -hmm. and we've got equity uplift as well and you have this confidence to go, Oh, I, I I had my hesitations and reservations around mortgage insurance, but it's simply a way to get in and, yep. and, and springboard that to to keep scaling as well. So awesome. And then you look at the mortgage insurance fees. I mean, we're talking about two percent here. One to two percent. One to two percent. Depen de yeah, it yep. depends on how much you're borrowing. So it's it's good to understand how that's priced. Too. Yeah, that's, that's so right. insurance is priced basically it's on risk, but also size of risk. Um and so the the way we price it was we looked at the amount you're borrowing and the loan-to-value ratio, LVR. The lower the LVR, obviously the less the risk, so we price we, we price mm. lower. Um, the other thing that drives our pricing is also the capital that we have to hold, so that's money that we have to put into a savings account, so to speak, um, in case the loan is to, goes into default. And that's regulated by APRA. Um, and you know, brokers will know this, That and it's, if you plot the cost of LMI as you go up the LVR yeah. curve, there's certain inflection points, and they're based on risk and capital. And so if you go from 79 to 80, it kicks up a little bit, to 80, 81, it kicks up quite a bit, 85, 88, 89, it's a big kick because the his, history shows us that once you go through 90% LVR, then claims kick up and, and loans are a lot riskier. And then they, it, that, that curve sort of gets steeper as you're going towards 95. Yeah. And so that's what drives our pricing. And so, um, you, you know, you can, if you're borrowing at like 88, 89%, you can save yourself a bit in LMI as opposed to going to 90. But I also say don't let that be a blocker, yeah. right? If you can't get, if you've got to borrow more than 90, then so be it. Yeah. Right? Just be aware that you can play with that might save you a little bit. And not every lender is equal. Like when we have no. our mortgage insurance breakdown, we're mm. literally as a broker, we've got to calculate it, it shows mm. us all the banks. And you can see the disparity in, in it's the same loan, 
the same property, same postcode, mm. same loan to value ratio, and you get a completely different variance across all the different banks. They all change. Yeah, and that's, that's look, that's based on um, how that bank has performed historically. So mm. um, LMI is priced, it's called community pricing, right? Mm. So the pricing's for that whole lender based on their performance over time. And yes, they do They do vary. The variance has got less and less. As lenders mm. have got better and better writing cre- uh, credit, the variance has got less and less, but they do exist. So definitely have a look around. Yeah. yeah. And so what, uh, what Sean was mentioning earlier is what we call L- LVR bands, mm. uh, LMI bands. So yeah, if you've got a f- you know five to ten percent deposits, generally where it's the most expensive, yep. ten to fifteen percent deposit has a different range, yep. and then fifteen to twenty percent deposit yep. probably that lowest Correct. part there. The way I used to explain it to clients was in when you have a called a five or a seven percent seven percent deposit, it'd be like me in my twenties driving a black sports car, <laughs> a high risk, and yep. that was that was reflected when I had my insurance premium when I, yes. I, I I had a sports car, very expensive to insure. Young male in the suburbs yeah. versus someone that's got a, a, a family suburban uh, Toyota Camry, a 15% yep. deposit going, that's not really too much of a risk and, yeah. and, and, and the insurance premium reflects that as well. So if you're very curious, ask to speak to your broker and say, look, where do I sit? Generally some of that 15 uh, to 12% deposit, uh, once you add on the mortgage insurance, you're still under a 90% loan to value ratio. Uh, from our perspective, that's where you can still be interest only on the loans and then the interest rate doesn't jump up over mm. that 90% mark. Mm. That's, again, probably where things get misunderstood because the rate just, you know, from a bank's perspective, the mortgage insurance is there to protect the loan, but then I guess their deterrent is also they'll jump, they'll increase yeah, that the, rate as a premium. Yeah, the interest is is because it's higher risk. It's yeah. even it's still risk for the bank, right? Mm. Um, it's, it's not zero risk, so those prices do tick up as you borrow more yeah. um, of the value of the property. Yeah, and so people get offended because they're on good incomes and like, mm. right, mm. save my ass off to, to get my <laughs> 10% deposit. It would be the same way if someone came to you to ask for money to go and they're like, hey, mate, I'm good for it, yeah, yeah. but I've got nothing to show for it. Mm. And that's the bank's view of the world. So don't be offended by it. It's just they're, They've got a risk team. They've got their own yep. price and it sits behind it. They've got you know years of skin in the game, decades, centuries, some banks as well. So they're looking and leaning on that experience to go, this they is do. why They've got to get to know you and this is where the brokers help. Right? Yeah. They've got to get to know the borrower um, and then they're taking a punt or well, are you worth the risk to lend to you? Mm. Right? So, um, And this is where brokers can, can add a lot of value is they know all the information that is required by banks to get comfort in lending you money. Mate, this is it. Are we talking about... And this is the stuff that you can't see because it's intangible, what, mm. what, you know, what we call loan submission quality. So as a broker, when we're submitting a loan to a bank, the loan notes and the detail that goes into that, that can make or break a deal. Absolutely. You can put the exact same deal, I'm talking the exact same clients, same income, same documents to a bank, but you could probably get two different outcomes. Yep. As a broker, I've had hours of conversations with a client. I've got to know their, you know, their goals, their Absolutely. income. And it, a, a credit manager at a bank is looking at this all within the space of maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, trying to decipher, is the bank going to lend? So they've got 20 or 30 minutes to make a decision. The broker's had hours of conversations getting to know these clients. So they able to translate that into a loan application, a static form, for example. That's where the level of detail and diligence really comes into it, which makes or breaks an application. So uh, can you talk about their income? Can you talk about why they've moved houses a few times? Can you talk about their assets and liabilities? Is there savings pattern or lack of or... We've had clients that have gone through IVF and that's where their savings have gone. Yep. You explain it to a bank and like, okay, cool, we get it. But that also means they're going to start a family, right? I'm like, yes, we've thought about that. And, you know, they've got, they've got savings yep. to then cover off, you know, when, when a partner goes on on uh, paternity or maternity leave as well. And, and it's really making the bank comfortable around the risk that they're taking. Correct. Yeah? Yeah. Yep. All righty. Um, in terms of LMI waivers, you mentioned this at the very start mm, mm. and you said some banks will, you know, waive the mortgage insurance and mm-hmm. people's ears prick up. Yep. So let's go through this. Mortgage insurance waivers is there for so certain professions. So we're talking doctors, dentists, physios, lawyers, accountants, for example, come to mind, bank employees yep. also yep. as well. So who takes on that, that risk? Because yep. we're going like we said at the very start, can we adjust the LMI, uh, yeah. the LVR? Yeah. The banks are saying, yeah, we'll go to 90% and not have a yeah. LMI fee? So in, in essence, the, the bank does. They, yeah. they take the risk. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason they're willing to uh, waive the LMI for certain professions is, again, historically those professions um, have good incomes 
and often growing incomes over time. Um, and over over time, they have shown that they don't default, or they default very very rarely. So again, it's risk reward. Um, most of the lenders that do waivers are the big lenders, yeah. um, because they have a different model, internal model for uh, recognizing risk in capital. And so while they take the risk, the capital impost on them is not as great as others. Um, but over time, um, they'll offer those products. Um, ask right, do you uh, does your pro- profession qualify? Okay, because mm. um, it could save you LMI. It could save you a lot of other costs. Actually. Saves a lot, and yeah. I'll be surprised about how many people don't know it exists. No, like, exactly. You know, and so, if you if you qualify, absolutely. Yeah. Again, though, if you do qualify but you need ninety two percent, don't wait. Right. Mm. So, okay, you'll have to pay LMI this time. Um, but are you going to wait and, and save that extra, you know, two, three, four percent? Um, look, you could if you can get there quickly. But again, think about time to get into the market and what that does in terms of earning you equity straight away. Yeah, mm. thanks very much. Mm. It's interesting. You mentioned around the government now becomes effectively a competitor. It does. It, it has. Does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it has. Have they done a good job, do you think? Or what's, I guess, when you guys are looking yeah. at the market, obviously, do you competitive analysis and you go, right, there are other, there are other you know, competitors in the mortgage there are, yeah, space. They're not the only provider. Yep. That's correct. Uh, but the government, have they done mm-hmm. a good enough job? In, look, um, they came into the market in 2020, I think the 2020 election, um, under the Morrison government at the time, 19. Um, look, there was a need in the market that they saw where there um, were still a lot of people who just could not afford LMI mm. to get in the market, were taking too long or could never save the 20%. Okay, and so they initially offered um, ten thousand places where the government would actually offer the banks a guarantee yeah. if that loan defaulted, but they only guarantee fifteen percent of the um, of the actual loan. Right? Um, was that a good thing? I think it was. Right? Uh, because it actually gave a cohort of people who would never get into the property market an option and a chance to get in. Yeah. Where we think, again, this is our view because it's our market, where we think they've probably got it wrong is they've extended that very quickly because it's a vote winner from 10,000 places to 50,000 places, mm. right? And so that now has taken a quite a lot of market share from the industry yeah. and it's very hard to compete when something's free, okay? Mm. Um, so while we believe it's absolutely a viable product, we think at 50,000 that's too many. Um, and we'll see over time how that goes. Yeah. Right? Uh, the other issue is that we've been through a very benign market, so the government actually hasn't had to pay a lot of claims yet, right? And it's taxpayers' money they're putting up, which is fine. Um, our view is that uh, that money, you know, could probably be directed elsewhere. Mm. Okay? But, look, it's here, it's in the market. If you qualify, great, right, go for it. If you don't, then don't panic, right? There are other options such as LMI, so consider that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, 50,000 spots, the, I'd say, and personally, you know, I probably do more investors than I do first-time buyers these days, but having a chat to a lot of people, yeah, they don't, they're not eligible. Mm. All the price caps that they've actually introduced, they can't actually buy something of quality or substance and they're going to outgrow it, yep. which is cool. I mean, it's just, at, at that point, it's what we call a stepping stone strategy, yep. which means you're going to get into it, you're going to not pay your mortgage insurance, Maybe get uh, less stamp duty or no stamp duty, but you're buying typically Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, you're buying a smaller property yep. with a view that you're going to outgrow that in court five yep. years' time. Yep. Have to sell it, upgrade, and then try and, you know, then you pay a, you get a lot of stamp duty as stamp well. Stamp duty, you'd, yep. You and then that, have to buy that. that three or four bedroom house in the meantime yep. is being compounded at a much probably better rate than sometimes at the units. Yep. So that, so we're weighing it up going, do you just stretch yourself now to get in the market, pay the mortgage insurance? You've got one move in you, which is this bigger house, mm. or you've got two moves in you, which means there's all the costs that come with like yeah, it's an upgrading. It's a really good point, an interesting point, and it's I think you know you you get it is think more deeply about I've just got to get in in, in any property right now. If that's the, your only option, absolutely go mm. for it. But think about what other things you could do right. So okay, if I if I borrow a bit more right or go for a bigger house and therefore I don't qualify for the scheme, then not qualifying for the scheme shouldn't be a reason to try and scale down to qualify for it. So really think about what are you getting, what could it do, have a look at research. Your broker's got a lot of um, property insights as well. Mm -hmm. right? They're things you should consider. If the scheme stacks up, 
go for it. But if it doesn't, you've got other options. Yeah, well said. Mm. Well said. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to like go back to the very start. And mm. again, uh, I'm all about raising the bar. Yeah, so that's what we've done consistently for uh, for this podcast as well. Uh, I look around at my peers, and you mentioned around you know the top ten percent generally in mortgage broking yep. are the ones that get it. I've had a chat to a number of mortgage broking coaches, and this general what they say is the top ten percent call it a, we'll call it nineteen thousand brokers. So top ten percent, we're talking maybe two hundred brokers. A good place to start if you're looking for someone strategic is the MPA Top 100. That's usually about one of our benchmarks in our industry for you know, brokers that are doing a good amount of business. Uh, don't look at the number that they're doing in terms of loans. It's a vanity metric. When you're doing over $100 million worth of lending a year, you're coming across pretty much every scenario that's under yeah. the sun. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting bounced to a good broker, but at that point other brokers maybe can't do it. It's outside their skill set. I know at the very start you know, I lost deals to really, really good brokers and it makes you hungry to get better. So if you're looking for a good – or look up someone that's, you know, an uh, investor that's got a portfolio where you're looking to do, ask them who they use as a broker, tap them on the shoulder, be prepared that some, anyone that's worth their weight in, in gold as a broker is going to have a bit of a wait time to get in and that's okay. It's better to play the waiting game and get the right advice than to be ra- you know, to be a bit rash and try and get in but you've got bad advice that's going to set you further backwards as well so this all forms part of this conversation around the right strategy the right partners the right team that becomes a real good foundation for you to have those pillars for success in growing your property portfolio as well so sean i'll say thank you very much mate always a pleasure having having having, you yeah it's great to come in i think you've got great energy mate obviously the product has to sell itself you can't be out there you know tooting your horn going look at us and speaking of tooting your horn i mean you guys just walked away with uh, our industry body. So our industry body is the Mortgage and Profe- uh, Finance Association of Australia, MFAA. At the uh, national awards, you guys walked away at the uh, – Service uh, provider of the service year. Service provider Absolutely. of the year. So, again, just that reassurance that you guys are doing a great job in the industry, doing a great job for borrowers as well. So uh, if you're thinking mortgage insurance, ask your, ask your broker, for example, who is the mortgage insurance provider because that's something that you may not know or mm. be aware of. Um, then One other um, plug I will just give for yeah, us definitely. is that we do have a lot of information on our website, helia.com.au, um, that explains mortgage insurance, gives you some tips on looking to get how you can get to the property. There's some calculators there. There's a great calculator which is available to brokers and mm-hmm. borrowers called uh, the Deposit um, Comparison Estimator. And it actually allows you to look at all the options you've got nice. in getting that sort of 5% and then getting into the property and gives the pros and cons. So look that up. It's awesome. uh, helia.com.au. All oh, right. Brilliant. We'll include a link to that yeah, uh, that you. calculator mm. as well. I think that would be awesome because that ultimately is the big question, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Can I get in and what, what, what what's the opportunity cost of waiting as well? Yeah. Right. Lovely. If – You've loved this episode. One, we're loving the feedback. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm blown away by the amount of messages that we're getting from people that are really actively reaching out now. Uh, so for me, I'm, I'm always humbled by that, uh, that when you take time out to leave us a message. Most importantly, though, if you know that someone's trying to get into the market and this is one of the big issues they've got, the deposit hurdle, please share this episode with them. We want to challenge maybe some kind of norms that they've got set around deposits or what it takes to get into the market, particularly if they're staunch around that 20% deposit. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.